You are listening to Where is the Music Podcast. My name is Alberto and on this program I will talk about music in all its forms. I discuss the creative part, the understanding of music, the role that music has in our culture, our shared life, our psyche, and I will do that with the help of my piano. You can find me on all major podcasting platforms and my work as composer, pianist and teacher at albertoferro.com. This podcast has no sponsor. If you like to support me, click the link to my Patreon page, available in the description. With a contribution as little as few dollars a month, you will significantly help me keep doing what I do. Now, on to this episode of Where is the Music? Hello everyone, welcome back. In this episode, I thought I was going to be a little bit... uh, free-flowing. I have selected um, a few interesting sentences, quotes, sometimes thoughts that came out of either my practice time or uh, my teaching that uh, I thought I was going to share and perhaps uh, offer some commentary. Uh, I have seven. Let's see if we can get through all of them uh, in uh, without getting lost in a constructive and uh, interesting way the first one is very much related to this podcast (laughs) it is hard to talk about music because music doesn't need to be talked about i remember this one Uh, it came out of a conversation i had with the with a student about uh, the nature of music obviously uh, It is hard to talk about music because music to be appreciated, to be understood, to be felt, to be communicated doesn't need to be talked about. Music is a different type of uh, vehicle. It's not language. It's not made of words. Even when there are words like lyrics and when uh, lyrics are sung, uh, we won't find the beauty just in the words but in the way the words are put into music Um, so first question would be can there be words about music can there be a way to represent music maybe with a word maybe with scores what what are in the end musical scores if not somehow visual representation of something about music I argue that there isn't uh, anything other than representations of uh, music there isn't uh, any other way that we have to use words or or images uh, to just make representations of it but the question can go really deep down a philosophical rabbit hole because the moment you uh, represent something then well that is not the thing it's just a representation of it so and then there is another another aspect of this sentence music doesn't need to be talked about music doesn't need as if music is an entity with I don't know, agency that needs something. Uh, but is that the case? Can we think of music like, like that? Well, um, music has always been related to human intention. The difference, the fundamental difference between a sound that we happen to hear and a note that is being played is that the sound coming from a musical instrument is uh, is the result of a human intention and so we are uh, automatically drawn to uh, give it some sort of second level second dimension of of meaning Uh, but then music doesn't need music is not an agent but music is a vehicle of human intention is a vehicle for agency still doesn't need to be talked about 
meaning that every time someone uh, delivers uh, their message their intention through uh, music uh, I suspect that there is no other way to get it than through sound mm -hmm. meaning if we try to represent it in words we are probably uh, missing the point uh, similar to paraphrases of uh, poems in a, in a school it has happened uh, often that I felt uh, that uh, the only thing that we can make paraphras paraphrases of is pretty much just the logical linguistic uh, narrative content of a poem uh, we can imply uh, assume uh, maybe feelings that uh, emerges from it but uh, we cannot really um, state them in words and the moment we do we are bound to um, our own personal interpretation and so in a sense this tells me that music operates at some sort of uh, a dimension that um, is more than logical more than rational uh, deeper than rational probably on this um, last topic without getting lost in this uh, uh, very interesting at least for me um, deep uh, point I would mention a philosopher uh, and psych psychanalyst I think uh, recently has published uh, um, Im quite important books it's called Liam McKilgirst and um, he describes uh, the ways uh, in which we pretty much uh, operate uh, in reality there are we have two separate ways of attending uh, reality one is uh, the um, uh, detailed uh, operational analytic uh, which is uh, uh, our ability to narrow down our attention uh, directing our attention to things so that we um, can operate properly perhaps picking up a uh, piece of food or uh, you know playing a note on an instrument and the exact opposite of narrowing down which is opening up our attention to the surrounding uh, uh, being open to things that are unexpected and this is if I don't uh, misinterpret what he's trying to say is about our ability to experience things on multiple levels of perception uh, the sensorial perception um, our ability for example to uh, feel hear uh, participate have ex having experiences accepting the uh, here and now uh, without necessarily uh, narr narrowing it down or analyzing it um, uh, and these are uh, as you can see two completely opposite ways of uh, uh, being alive in the world and we constantly uh, bounce from one to the other uh, the philosopher makes the point that uh, these two ways of attending reality are pretty much the main um, features the main uh, capabilities main uh, activities of the uh, two hemispheres of the brain um, music is the place where both of our attention uh, are constantly intertwined uh, music <laughs> can be experienced uh, by either but it makes more sense when it is experienced by both we f we experience it fully but we can't narrow it it down to an, an analysis a uh, logical linguistic rational analysis but then we can narrow it down to a logical linguistic and rational analysis but when we do we miss the experience isn't that uh, interesting
second thought that I wanted to share is this. I don't really recall where I heard that. Uh, I should start annotating sources. Music is the art of accepting the unfinished. Music is the art of accepting the unfinished. Perhaps the way in which this makes more sense to me is considering unfinished as uh, incomplete, as something that requires some external element, some external participation. I'm thinking of uh, two examples of art. Uh, Michelangelo's um, sculptures, the ones particularly of those uh, slaves, warriors, uh, men coming that seem to be coming out of stone. And uh, the first thing that you will think if you if you've never seen before is that well this clearly look unfinished but um, those were not unfinished for Michelangelo he seemed to have uh, willfully um, shown these uh, figures coming out of uh, uh, raw uh, rock so we can debate or discuss for hours what uh, this type of art means, but uh, it certainly uh, th it's an invitation for the viewer to finish the work in their mind and to question and to uh, use their imagination to complete it. Uh, where is it uh, coming from? Where is it going? Why the conflict of coming out of uh, raw form like stone the other example is uh, jazz because a lot of time jazz improvisation is made of uh, phrases that are uh, unfinished and um, they are left for the listener to be completed uh, especially uh, I mean the artist who probably embodied most this philosophy was uh, certainly Miles Davis. It is not a chance uh, that Miles Davis became the most, uh, let's say, uh, referenced jazz artist uh, in the history of jazz. Uh, the type of improvisation that interacts with the listener is uh, the one that is most meaningful for all the attendance of a jazz concert. And so an improviser who is able to suggest something, a melody, to an idea to their listener and allowing their listener to develop it in their own imagination and creating a sort of uh, constant interplay with, with them, uh, a game. Um, uh, this, is, um, um, this is the way I, I think of when I uh, think of music as unfinished. But then there is another aspect of this phrase, which is the art of accepting the unfinished. Uh, it's not just we have to accept it, but is is the art of accepting. So possibly it has to do with the practical aspect of music making, which is, if you've ever tried, which is seems to be an, uh, an impossible work to complete a never-ending path of learning of improving of refinement there isn't a moment in which you say all right i got it now i learned it now i know how to do it uh, we we can refine it forever it will always be or at least feel unfinished so it is a path to patience and acceptance um, it is a way to learn about ourselves and to make ourselves more and more um, resilient and, and patient towards uh, 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 the work that we create. So music as the art of that is probably because um, you can only learn by doing it. You can only accept the unfinished by uh, 
practically putting yourself into the um, into the field and um, and struggle like uh, everyone else in the same field okay let's uh, let's go with the, the uh, sentence number three if artistic ideas spring from the unconscious and are created with the body then music represents a perfect alignment between body and mind hmm. that seems this needs a bit of unpacking if artistic ideas spring from the unconscious that's my we might not be all agree with this but by artistic ideas i mean the general general place in um, uh, where it is come from it's either our brain our inspiration our um, uh, w w whatever w whatever whenever we have motivation to sit at the piano or uh, uh, your instrument or even if you are a painter a drawer or a, or a uh, artistic creator of any type you sometimes experience some ideas uh, working through you and uh, it might not be very clear where these ideas come from so let's just say that comes from unconscious as a shortcut to say that comes from somewhere that we don't really know where it is what we know and what all arts uh, art fields have in common is that they are eventually created with the body well then music if this is the case represents a perfect alignment between body and mind uh, alignment in the here and now of body and mind i argue that there will be no music without this kind of alignment there will be no chance for us to um, to experience it and there will be no chance for us to uh, even listen to it because you will need someone to be aligned and as a listener we will have to be aligned we cannot really uh, do other things for example uh, washing the dishes or reading uh, there will be a partial experience of music the only other art for which I would say this is uh, likely this is possible um, is uh, is ballet dancing uh, it seems that um, body and mind needs a perfect alignment for um, for the uh, expression uh, in ballet to happen um, of course there is more to that uh, it's body mind and i would say intention a sense of uh, personal individual agency that needs to come in for music to happen but in general uh, body and mind first needs to be uh, in perfect alignment and before uh, before we run into um, misunderstanding i don't imply that music is because of this reason a higher level of art not at all actually if you think about it even a painter needs his or her gesture on the canvas to be perfectly aligned with their intention with their ideas so obviously an artist and I suspect this is the case for every art an artist needs to create in a, a dimension uh, of alignment but um, a painter just needs it needs to do it once and uh, that performance is gone while the painting stays that alignment doesn't need to be reproduced anymore but the painting stays and the painting will be the one that will be experienced at a later time by the viewer while for the music, uh, without uh, that uh, actual practical uh, state of alignment, there will won't be any music. If the performance, the performer is not 
aligning themselves during a performance well then there will be no music this is the only way in which uh, i think music somehow occupies a slightly uh, different place within the arts Number four, this is about honesty as a performer. Stop focusing on the sound you want to hear and start focusing on the sound you actually hear. I found myself recommending this quite cryptic sentence <laughs> to some of my students. Um, this ties in with the dimension of uh, the things that we want to get from the music we play rather than um, the things we are getting from the music we make is like uh, very often students um, w even myself actually when i practice i focus on the type of things that i want to um, uh, deliver that i want to communicate rather than what I'm actually communicating. This is something um, that I um, investigate a bit longer length um, on my blog. It's, there it's, a, it's a, an item called uh, What Does It Mean To Hear? Uh, you can find it on my website albertoferro.com and uh, um, it basically uh, relates with uh, our ability to hear uh, hearing is obviously a very complex thing and we tend to think we are able to hear what needs to be heard at least in music but the um, the study of music the study of uh, the practice of music shows um, i would say extremely well how much there is to hear not just in music, but in reality, in the world. Sound not just can communicate, but sounds um, are complex, are rich, and can be investigated to the point that we can hear many things in sound only if we were able to notice those. So in a sense, the practice of uh, music, the study of music is a way to learn how to hear what it is to hear and uh, uh, very often when we uh, practice for example for a performance or an exam we practice our piece to the highest level of proficiency maybe even even perfection um, we tend to uh, idealize very much uh, the uh, the final result and uh, somehow either we are imitating that ideal version of the piece that we have in mind or we are um, simply operating the tasks that are necessary to to get there uh, this is obviously not in itself bad or wrong but uh, i argue that um, we might get a little bit lost in the um, in the moment in a sense we are not paying as much attention to what 
exactly what type of sounds we are creating because we are focused on the type of sound that we want to create so mm, for example only only today i was uh, um, in class with a student quite an advanced student and uh, um, he brought uh, quite a complicated uh, romantic uh, piece of music with which was practiced at a quite a high level of uh, detail um, everything was uh, um, um, studied in, with accuracy and it was very precise it was very musical and there was no real um, issue practically technically or i would say even musically the phrases were there the dynamics were there but um, i had the sense that uh, the sound that he was making was not um, the, um, communicating as much as he wanted to getting lost into the details into the, let's say the desire of playing accurately and perfectly which is obviously an uh, uh, encomiable thing to aim at of course but uh, drove the student the attention of the students away from the whole point of the piece of music which uh, we agreed at the end of lesson was an outburst of uh, energy uh, a, very, a very explosive uh, energetic piece and uh, this wasn't communicated exactly because uh, the performance uh, that i heard from him in class was uh, rather um, accurate and cautious and uh, too concerned with the details in other words too concerned with an ideal perfect beauty precise and crystal clean that he was aiming at um, so do you see the point um, he wasn't focusing enough on the sound that he was creating because if he would have noticed uh, he would have probably agreed with me that uh, he sounds cautious and not exciting while the reason why he chose the piece is exactly to sound exciting and uh, 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 energetic and uh, um, so um, this is quite common of course at any level uh, but uh, it's very good to have uh, an ideal version to aim at to imitate uh, but too often we get lost in it and we are not paying a hundred percent attention of the sound that we are creating here right now with my instrument There are, I think, three stages of learning. First is uh, exercise. The second is bring out its meaning, meaning the, the meaning of the thing that you're trying to improve, you're trying to practice. And the last is bring out your meaning. This thought came after a few years of um, uh, accompanying ballet classes with the, with the piano, um, particularly with regards to uh, the way a ballet class uh, is structured. Typically, you have uh, two very separated phases, the center and the bar, um, and in which uh, you will see the center um, is usually a moment in which people, uh, dancers, uh, warm up and get uh, in tune somehow, get their body awakens and they start aligning themselves, they, their intention, their, um, their gestures, and their movements. And the second part, of course, after it, 
the center which is the place the moment where uh, the practice and the exercise we have they have done earlier um, uh, becomes an actual uh, moment of expression so expression full expression is the goal of the ending part of class at least is what i could gather uh, with my musician look from behind the piano um, but uh, i mentioned earlier there are three phases three stages of learning and i would say the um, in this uh, with this analogy of the ballet class that uh, there is a third initial phase of it uh, right before the class starts usually uh, dancers um, take at least 10 15 minutes to warm up to do some stretching to 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 just uh, uh, do the minimum um, operations to wake up uh, their body before the class starts these three phases uh, kind of uh, overlap um, the the exercising part the warming up part uh, is of at the very beginning and uh, as you warm up you put more intention to it you put more uh, detailed and refined gestures and as you put more detailed gestures and as you find your alignment you get to more expressive uh, movements more expressive exercises which tend to happen uh, in the center part of class uh, the um, the bar uh, and the the, far the farther you go uh, the more the exercise will become just about expression so you see a sort of curve from the better um, technical aspect to the, m to the most expressive I find this uh, quite interesting as a musician because this pretty much describes the trajectory of, e of every practice session <laughs> I had in my life <laughs> I sit at the piano and I need to do something to wake up and it's not necessarily a technical thing but uh, the wake up I'm looking for is a waking up of, uh, of my body connecting my ear to my brain to my fingers and uh, the, f the more the more I go into it the more I'm able to uh, make better choices and hearing myself and things become more aligned so I can start expressing things to the point that at the end I would expect a performing moment, an ex uh, a moment in which expression is the um, is the priority. Um, it is very hard to do the opposite, or at least it's not it's not so so straightforward that you will start by performing a piece of music and uh, that you will do the technical work afterwards. Sometimes it's good to try it; it's good to do it for different reasons. But you see the point of this trajectory. Um, it's also interesting that uh, um, in ballet class I find um, something that is absolutely uh, I would say I would argue absolutely needed for every music class uh, my students know well this because I constantly invent exercises on the spot um, a ballet class is pretty much created following let's say uh, a basic form a basic um, uh, trajectory order of exercises are maybe uh, uh, they change from teacher to teacher from class to class but they tend to follow a standard mm, but however the, ex the exercises are invented and explained right before by the teacher to the students so the students needs to learn them on the spot and perform them the exercises on the spot this is uh, something that, that as a teacher oh this is this is fantastic because uh, uh, this type of practice where uh, we invent the music right on the spot is uh, the way we learn to communicate musically you hear it and you reproduce it there is in, th in theory at least <laughs> i don't think that there is any other way to learn music because the score doesn't doesn't make you hear the intention of the music that's something that you need to find 
but if you hear someone performing the score with intention then you can learn how to reproduce it and by doing so you learn the potential of your instrument the potential of the score and more importantly your potential how interesting huh so um, i reinforce uh, the importance of uh, uh, making up your exercises as you go depending on the need depending on the necessity of uh, this particular passage of this particular piece or technique and uh, this also uh, promotes a creative way of practicing uh, uh, an approach to for example technique that uh, uh, is not a finished type of uh, field you will never be technically proficient 100 percent but you will improve this particular technique by creating ad hoc exercises that will serve that particular expressive musical purpose this is uh, also a way to promote uh, learning by ear. that is not something that works only for um, I don't know, modern pop or rock or or jazz music but it's something that should be uh, should be done uh, with every genre of music at every stage and uh, with every um, at every age and level of, of learning uh, yeah this, uh, this is a good uh, good thing to discuss I believe see if we can do them so good music defies structure and form so why should we learn structure and form well this is interesting um, this is something that can be said probably not about music only but about all art uh, that when a good piece of music emerge emerges or a good piece of art a good architecture a good uh, idea uh, from Picasso to Renzo Piano from Beethoven to uh, Miles Davis uh, when a great piece of music comes out it does so by challenging our preconceived ideas on structure and form so somehow it redefines the possibility of artistic expression of uh, uh, creativity of uh, repertoire so why then should we learn structure and form what is there for if in the end the only things of value will um, uh, will come out of uh, ideas that challenge those uh, this is an eternal conflict and I would say uh, perhaps uh, my experience is that uh, we need to learn structure and form in particular through the existing repertoire S we need to learn them because we need to dive in a language uh, we need to recognize that creativity needs to be put in in practice needs to come out in the world as a um, as a practical form as a real form so when we learn about the existing structure and form the repertoire perhaps the classics the romantics or the whatever we learn how uh, creative ideas has been um, shaped has been somehow ruled within the constraint of the time the constraint that the creators have put to themselves in the end that's that's how we learn language if we won't have a language our possibilities are infinite by learning a language we are obviously uh, uh, restraining our possibilities to that one language but 
if we don't learn any you don't get to say anything practically and no one will be able ever to understand you so uh, it's a balance perhaps the, the great pieces of art created and, and music pieces of art created in the past they just show us that languages have uh, limits that's all but it's up to us to master a language so much that we can uh, discover um, further potential we can break some rules this is this is what uh, would be my instinct in reply to uh, to this question why should we learn a structure and form studying structure and form by for example studying the classics uh, is uh, to me is a way to um, conduct ourselves train our brain train our creativity to um, to discipline our um, our production our practice uh, and to uh, not just let be uh, driven by impulses which are of course <laughs> very important but um, Renzo Piano has never created um, a design has never produced a uh, building architecture a design by following his impulses or neither has done uh, Picasso nor Beethoven okay um, probably there should be much more to be said but I'm just gonna leave these are there and I'm going to the seventh final um, quote for today uh, this is about uh, pure creativity and um, improvisation this is a quote I find in the book music as creative practice by Nicholas Cook uh, an important musicologist of uh, today by the way this book is quite uh, intense uh, but something that I recommend to anyone interested in the topic he says quote real-time decision-making is inherently improvisatory so that all performances even of canonic works played from the score are in a real sense acts of improvisation just as the multiple small decisions involved in notated arrangements might be seen as improvisations on paper and the same is true of everyday human existence as Tim Ingold and Elizabeth Hallam write which are other two um, musicologists improvisation and creativity are intrinsic to the very processes of social and cultural life I'm gonna write I'm gonna read it again real time decision making is inherently improvisatory so that all performances even the canonic works played from the score are in a real sense acts of improvisation just as the multiple small decisions involved in notated arrangements might be seen as improvisations on paper and the same is true of everyday human existence as Tim Ingold and Elizabeth Hallam write improvisation and creativity are intrinsic to the very processes of social and cultural life end of quote how interesting huh? improvisation and creativity are intrinsic to the very processes of social and cultural life if only we were able to make the world of uh, score readers score interpreters and the world of music improvisers communicate more i would think we will all be much better off uh, after all we are all improvising all the time even when you even when you're reading your beethoven bach chopin model scores to perfection you are still just improvising mm, how interesting it is all right i'm gonna leave you with this and um, i look forward to our next episode of uh, where is the music thank you for listening and bye bye thanks for listening to where is the music podcast if you enjoyed this episode look up for others i made a few 
I publish an episode every week roughly, investigating each time a different aspect of music, the music making, the music listening, the meaning of music and its relevance in our lives. It is very helpful for me if you like, subscribe, follow on your favorite platform, where is the music is on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, TuneIn and Google Podcasts. If you like to support me, you are free to do so through Patreon. Link in description. Thank you again. Until next time.